Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to have my good friend Cherie Goff from Arkansas with me, uh, helping with the interpretation of this dream. Actually, Dana, my name is Wendy, but please continue. And I want to just say a couple of things. First of all, I'm praying that God is raising up more and more dreamers. We need people dreaming. Um, God used uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He used Pharaoh. But he used people who, were, who knew who God was to bring those dreams out and understand comprehension of them. And I, I, even I had three or four people today who have sent me and said, I've had a dream. What should I do with it? And I'm saying this. Go to your social media. Put it out there. It's not about going viral. It's not about getting everybody's attention. It's about being obedient to what God's put on your heart. And if he shows you something, he is showing you that something so somebody else can see what's, what's happening. I agree. If the Almighty shows us something, we're obligated to share it with others. People every day who will send me dreams and visions and things that they're hearing, and there is a, there is a consistent weaving of the fabric. People are seeing the same things. People are seeing the same shaking and the same type of sifting and shifting in the country. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing consistent dreams of fire. Even this morning, I got about seven or eight different people who sent me dreams about fire. And so the dream that I'm sharing today had some fire in it. So I'm going to go ahead and share the dream real quick. It's a little bit longer because I had it Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, and Monday night. Every single night. I had a part of the stream, and that's never happened. This is very unusual for me, a little bit of shifting with it. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and read the dream, and then Sharice going to do some interpretation. We'll talk about those things. Um, Dana, my name is Wendy. You know, like the wind. Wendy. But uh, I really believe that God is trying to still wake the church up. I will tell you this. I spoke to Stan Johnson. We are planning on doing another um uh, September Solemn Assembly prayer event. We're not for sure yet, but uh, I had a great time there that last year, 40 hours of prayer and fasting, and uh, we know the nation needs it. And uh, this is a calendar dream as well. It ends in September. And we had talked, and Stan will tell you, we talked about this two or three weeks ago. And so when I had this dream over the last couple of nights, or last, the last week, I knew we needed to do something with it. So we will be doing another September Solemn Assembly prayer event. Uh, details will be announced as soon as we get it figured out. But we need to pray for the country, and I pray that the church will see in this dream we need to wake up. So here we go. This dream went from 11, April 11th to the 19th. I saw a globe. It was sitting on a stand. No hand touched it or moved it, but it just began spinning on its own and accelerating at a very, very rapid rate, rate. and it began to wobble. It began to wobble on the stand. And there were two male runners who appeared on a running track, but this running track was just a straight track. It went on for miles and miles and miles. But between the two runners, there was a large wall, probably 20 feet high, so they couldn't see each other. They each had a spear with a fire-like torch on the end that was burning very bright, and the flames shot up from the tip. Now, it did not appear as if it was a torch or had fabric wrapped around it. It was just a sharp piece of metal that was on fire, and both runners had it. One was wearing a multicolored outfit like you would see in the Olympics, and he was stretching and bouncing as if preparing to run. The other one was wearing a solid white outfit, like a track outfit, but was not moving at all. <coughs> he was standing in place almost without breathing. You would have swore the guy was a mannequin at first. A man then appeared standing on the wall above the runners in a very expensive suit jacket, but he was wearing runner shorts underneath and uh, runner shoes. So very, very strange looking outfit. And he carried a starter's pistol. And he said to the motionless runner, wearing the white, he said, you must pace yourself and win. And at this, the runner simply nodded and cracked his neck. The man in the colorful runner's outfit was not addressed at all. And the man then called out to your mark. And when he did this, the runner wearing the multicolored outfit took a running start and threw the flaming spear into the atmosphere, just threw it in the air. Then he took his place at the line in the runner's blocks. <coughs> The motionless man moved into position, but did not get down to the block, so almost like not an official start in that sense. But he leaned down, and he tapped the end of the spear into the ground, and then he spit on the flame, and it exploded. It exploded to the point that his hair caught on fire, but he was not hurt. His hair was burning, but like, like a burning bush, but he was, not, he was not hurt. And the man called Reddy. 
And then he fired the pistol, and the two men took off. Now, one, the, the multicolored man, ran very, very quickly and very determined. The fiery man just took off at a jog. And because of the wall between them, neither man could see the other. Then, then I saw a bright crimson red calendar with a crisp white letters that had a thick black outline on the letters. So they stood out. They were shadowed. And I saw May 2021 and two hands like this. Kind of like how your hands will just kind of unleashing something. And these two hands were unrolling this, well, they were holding on this blood-covered calendar, and they were rolling it out and down. And I saw June, July, August, and September. They were unrolled, and they hung below May, and September was touching the ground. So he's standing here like this with these, with the calendar in his hand, bloody, bloody hands, and the calendar's all the way down the ground from May to September, and September's touching the ground. Then the scene changed to a map of Europe, and it went through Russia, China, down to the Middle East, the Mediterranean. Israel was seemingly over, also overemphasized on this map. I saw leaders in Russia, China, Israel, Western Europe. These were modern leaders, and they had these high-powered binoculars, and they were watching the United States, and they were telling individuals to write down the things that they were seeing. They were getting excited. They were pumping fists in the air, patting each other on the backs. And they were waving their nation's flags feverishly. I saw military leadership in the rooms, and the leaders were whispering in their ears, and then would get on a phone and whisper as well. And I could then see blood dripping down onto the calendar from those hands that were holding. It was, it was going all the way through September. Then I saw fires all over America, and I saw cities on lockdown. I saw flags that were half masked, and they began to fade into smoke. And there were many American military groups on the ground directing traffic and keeping a close watch on the streets. And then I saw the colorful runner running very hard, and his hand was on the wall the entire time, but just brushing it. So he's running very hard, his hand's against that wall. And he was saying, wake up, or wake them up, wake them up. And he kept his eye on the spear he'd thrown. It was above him, heading in a direction, almost like he was following the spear. And the runner in white was now... A dingy gray. It had gone from white to dingy gray, and the white was completely gone from his, from his jersey. His hand was also on the wall, but it was leaving a trail of fire that followed him as he ran. The colorful runner was weary, was sweating profusely, uh, appeared several times to almost trip and fall, but he recovered and he kept going through, uh, you know, through the, the running, but he was breathing with great difficulty. He was, he was very tired. The jogging runner was smirking and taking his time, and now he was fully engulfed in fire and was spreading. Uh, it was spreading to the place where his gray jersey was now just a flaming red. It almost looked like somebody running with a fire around them. He then started running as fast as he possibly could and was making up distance. He was kind of catching up to the, the colorful runner. However, he kept his eye on the spear that he, still had, that he, had, that he had thrown and was still in the air. He, he out, um, I'm sorry, I got, got messed up there. It was heading towards the building. So the, the guy had thrown the spear. He's keeping his eye on the spear. He's running as hard and fast as he can. He's, he's trying to, you know, he's just trying to catch. He's trying to get going. He's watching that spear. And that spear was headed towards a building that seemed to be filled with people who were on their knees and they were praying loudly. And both runners kept moving with one spilling fire all the way along that wall. It was almost like a trail of fire behind him. Everything he touched was fiery. And the other was now screaming as loud as he could, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, constantly. He never stopped screaming, wake up. And then I saw American generals in a facility that was obviously underground, and I saw many phone calls, and they were coming in on rotary phones. I saw the curly Q, some of you will know what I'm talking about, the curly Q cords. They were coming in on rotary phones, and as the generals answered them, they were telling others to position numbers on a very large map of both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. And it was frantic in that room. People were obviously in a state of panic, running here and there very, very quickly. And I could then see world leaders in Europe, Russia, and Israel, modern-day leaders, talking with each other with great passion, great concern on their faces. Their faces revealed that they were they, these were very, very important things they were discussing. And then this word was spoken, it might be our time. It kept being spoken by the leaders as they watched the fires burning over America. 
Then the spear thrown by that first runner hit the building it was aiming for, and it exploded into a bright light, and it streamed down over the entire country. And it looked like a napalm storm. If you see the videos of, of us dropping bombs during the Vietnam War, they're in Vietnam. So it looked like a napalm storm. It filled the atmosphere of the United States. And as, 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 the, as the fire from that building spread, it was putting out some of the fires in the United States. It lessened some and others, but in some it had no impact at all. Some of those fires kept burning. And then I saw the explosion had actually thrown people all over the place. The people who were praying in that building were now, they were just like, like just, uh, just thrown up in the air to these areas of the nation. And um, these people, uh, they had thrown people all over the country, and they had like fire extinguishers and, and, and brooms. And they were patting down the fires. They were screaming. As they were patting down those fires, they were screaming, just like the colorful running man. They were screaming, wake up, stay awake, there's not much time. Wake up, stay awake, there's not much time. They kept repeating that. Wake up, stay awake, there's not much time. And the colorful runner then sat down. He leaned against the wall and he took a deep breath. He was just on the other side of the finish line. And the man that I see often in the dreams was helping him to his feet. And the fiery runner was laying, uh, was laying past the finish line too and was smoking like a, like a burnt building. He was not moving and was not breathing. And the man pointed at me and he said, Warn them there is not much time left and it will never be easy again. If you're not braced now, you won't make it. Not rooted, you will be pulled up, pulled out, and the fire will never go out. Look for me and endure till I come. And one other thing that's different about this dream is after, usually that, after the, the man speaks to me in the dream, uh, that's it. But I had another small piece, and this was Monday night. I then saw every one of those international leaders and American generals put down their phones at the very, very, very same time. And in unison, all at once, they said, it's time. It's time. Then they all sat, every single, the leaders, the military, they all sat at their desk, and they put their heads in their hands like this, and they began to weep. Thanks, Dana. I'll take it from here. Hey, everyone. Before I begin, I want to give a shout-out to Cherie Goff for her dream interpretation. Us Southern girls need to stick together. If you would like to watch the original video, I've got a link in the description box. In the dream, Dana saw two runners. Each one is carrying a spear that is on fire. Although they are burning, the spears are not consumed by the flames. In a similar way, the Great I Am used a burning bush that wasn't consumed to speak to Moses. Therefore, the burning spears represents the word of Yah which lets us know that both of the runners are believers. In ancient times, runners were used to deliver messages. In fact, the origins of a marathon comes from the legend of a Greek runner who ran from a city named Marathon to Athens to deliver a message about the war. Because we have all been commissioned to share the good news of salvation, in a way, the two runners represent us. A long, straight wall marks the race course. The wall represents the straight and narrow path that we are supposed to follow as we live our lives. Grazing their hands across the wall, both runners use it to guide their path as they run the race. This lets us know that they are not casual Christians, both of them are devout believers. Although they are both devout believers, they have very little in common, and so the wall also separates them one from another. In the Bible, we learn that the holy should separate themselves from the unholy. At the beginning of the race, it's hard to know who is the holy runner and who is the unholy runner. As the race progresses, it becomes more and more obvious. One of the runners is wearing a colorful running outfit. 
and the other one is clothed in white. Even though Dana didn't specify which side of the wall each of the runners is on, I have placed them in their locations based on the details of his dream. As the race progressed, Dana almost always started talking about the colorful runner first. Because Dana is an avid reader, his eyes are trained to go from left to right. Also, because the colorful runner isn't carrying his spear during the race, he can easily graze the wall with his hand no matter which side of the wall he is on. However, the only way that the other runner can graze his hand along the wall while carrying the spear is if he is placed on the right side of the wall. Unless, of course, he is left-handed. But because Dana didn't specify, I'm going to assume that the man is right-handed like 90% of the population. Now, before I go any further, let's talk about first impressions. On the left, we have a colorful runner who appears to be representing the LGBT community. On the right, we have a runner clothed in white. According to the Bible, white robes are associated with being clean, pure, and holy. For those of you who are politically minded, the wall appears to be separating the liberals from the conservatives. But it's not. It's actually dividing the sheep from the goats, which is described in Matthew. When the Son of Man comes into his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him all the nations will be gathered, and he will separate them one from another, like a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Based on our first impressions, it looks like the runner clothed in white is the guy we should be rooting for, but looks can be deceiving. We are seeing things from the starting line, but our Savior is located at the end of the race and sees things from a completely different angle. From his perspective, the colorful runner was always on his right hand. He calls us a light on a hill, and he knows that pure light is made of all colors. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment and like this video. Before the race begins, the colorful runner is stretching with his spear in hand. This symbolizes us building a relationship with the Almighty through prayer, Bible studies, and obeying the Holy Spirit. Some people might call this listening to their conscience. The runner clothed in white isn't doing anything to prepare for the race because he thinks it's not necessary. Dana saw a third man standing on top of the high wall. This man is wearing an expensive suit coat with running shorts and shoes. Also, he is carrying a starting gun. Although this man likes to call the shots, he represents more than wealth and authority. The reason he is standing on top of the wall of righteousness is because he wants to be elevated above the Almighty. Also, the reason he is wearing running shorts and shoes is because he is a messenger too. Does this remind you of anyone? Next, the evil messenger gives instructions to the unprepared runner clothed in white, saying, you must pace yourself and win. The runner clothed in white nods his head in agreement. Then he cracks his neck. Cherie suggested that this meant the runner clothed in white is stiff-necked, and I totally agree with her. Because him being stiff-necked is such an important clue to the overall meaning of Dana's dream, 
I'm going to take a few minutes to explore it further. The first time that stiff-necked is used in the Bible is when the Most High calls his own people stiff-necked during their 40 years in the wilderness. At the time, Moses, who was the spiritual leader of that era, was receiving instructions from the Almighty for 40 days. But the children of Israel got impatient and began to worship a golden calf. It's because of this that our Creator calls His own people, who worshipped the beast, I mean golden calf, stiff-necked. Nearly all English Bible translations call the golden calf a molten image. So, people think that it was a statue that was worshipped. However, in my translation, you'll discover that the golden calf was not a statue. It was actually a mask. And here's how I know. First of all, the children of Israel had just come out of Egypt, which is in Africa. And even today, there are some African tribes that use deity masks. Even the Egyptian deities are depicted as animal heads with human bodies and are considered chimera, hybrids. Also, the Israelites specifically requested from Aaron to make gods that walk before them. Statues don't walk, but people wearing masks do. And if that doesn't convince you, molten is translated from this Hebrew word, and it's pronounced maska, maska, mask. I hope that this helps you recognize that the stiff-necked runner is a devout believer who is deceived. Let's move on. For now, I'm going to focus on the stiff-necked runner, and then I'll explore the colorful runner further. When the evil messenger calls the runners to the starting line, the stiff-necked runner did not get into the runner blocks. He only leaned forward. His posture shows a lack of humility and respect for the King of Kings who is waiting at the end of the race. How many of us are so worried about the here and now that we don't pay attention to the eternal? Next, the stiff-necked runner taps the tip of the spear on the ground and spits on it. This disrespectful act shows us that he has a worldly understanding of the Bible and that he cherry-picks which scriptures he wants to believe and disregards the rest. The Bible tells us to meditate on the teachings of our Heavenly Father both day and night. However, because the stiff-necked runner doesn't do that, he is given a reprobate mind. We see this when the fire comes from the spear and his head appears to be burning. Because he is ignoring the word of the Most High and following the instructions of the evil messenger, the color of his jersey changes from white to gray, which is a mix of black and white. This mixing of the colors has another hidden meaning. If you figured it out, let me know in the comment section below. After the shot goes off and the race begins, the stiff-necked runner obediently follows the instructions of the evil messenger and paces himself. Not realizing that he has been deceived, the stiff-necked runner raises his hand across the surface of the straight and narrow wall as he runs. However, he is leaving a trail of fire behind him. Remember, he is a messenger too, so the trail of fire represents all the things he says that can cause others to be deceived. As the race progresses, he starts to pick up his pace, and his jersey changes colors again. It becomes red and appears to be burning. This is a consequence of his stubbornness 
because he is unwilling to admit he was wrong. Then, when the race is over, we see the unrepentant, stiff-necked believer lying motionlessly on the ground. His fate is obvious. Back on Mount Horeb, which means sword, by the way, our Creator was teaching Moses his guidelines when he noticed his people worshiping the golden calf. Not only did our Creator call them stiff-necked, his wrath was kindled against them, and he threatened to consume them and make a nation out of Moses. So, am I suggesting that wearing a mask is going to land us in hell? No, but it is a clue that should not be ignored. Please take a moment to share your thoughts below. When I think about the colorful runner preparing for the race, I can't help but be reminded of Joseph with his coat of many colors. Not only was he a dreamer, he was gifted in interpreting the dreams of others. Joseph endured many hardships, which included being rejected by his family and even being thrown into prison falsely. Despite it all, he held on to his faith and remained loyal to the Almighty. Joseph recognized that he was being prepared for something great. After many trials and tribulations, Joseph proved himself. Then the Almighty lifted him up out of obscurity into a position of authority. In the end, not only did Joseph save his family, but he was able to save the entire region from destruction because they were willing to follow his instructions. When the evil messenger calls the runners to the starting line, the colorful runner throws his spear into the atmosphere. Unlike the stiff-necked runner who sought a worldly interpretation of the Bible, the colorful runner seeks a divine interpretation of the word. And unlike the stiff-necked runner who barely leaned forward, the colorful runner gets all the way down into the runner blocks, humbling himself before the king of kings, who is standing at the end of the race. Once the race begins, the colorful runner sprints as fast as he can while grazing the long straight wall with his hand. Also, he continues to look up and watch his flaming spear. If we follow his example, we will discover that the trajectory of the spear creates a rainbow. By the way, for those of you who don't know, the rainbow is not a symbol of gay pride. It represents our Heavenly Father's promise to never curse the earth again because of mankind. For a moment, let's explore why the Almighty was motivated to curse the earth in the first place. It wasn't wickedness. Wickedness has existed since Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. During the days of Noah, people were marrying and being given in marriage, just like it always has been, with one exception. Our Bible tells us that the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and created hybrids. The Most High flooded the earth to wash away the corrupted blood. Being an obedient servant who waits for God's timing, the colorful runner begins to yell, Wake up! Wake them up! After the calendar scroll is seen, and he continues to look for divine instructions throughout the race as he watches the flaming spear travel. Once the spear hits its mark, it explodes into bright light. This bright light puts out some of the fires of damnation, but not all of them. The spear had targeted a building full of prayer warriors. Please note, Dana called it a building not a church. Once they hear the colorful runner's message of hope and the light ejects them from their prayer closet, 
they are activated and forced into action. It is like the colorful runner had passed the baton as the prayer warriors carry his message out into the world and help put out the fires of damnation. At the end of the race, the colorful runner sits just beyond the finish line and is leaning against the long straight wall. He is exhausted and winded. The stiff necked runner isn't touching the wall anymore. He was listening to the world and not the Almighty. Because of this, he has lost his way and his fate is sealed. Then the man who represents the King of Kings helps the colorful runner to his feet. Could this rising up be a clue about the rapture? Maybe. But nobody knows the day or hour of his return. And we should always be in a state of preparedness. Or could the colorful runner being helped up be more like the story of Joseph? And the Almighty is about to raise a person up out of obscurity into a position of authority. Time will tell. I want to save the warning that was given at the end of the race for the end of this video. For now, let's talk about the calendar scroll. Dana dreamt that two hands unrolled a long five-month calendar that touched the ground. This short scene is so complex that I think it's best to get the obvious out of the way. The calendar is seen after the race started. The race is actually a lot longer than five months. However, world events are going to intensify during these five months. Also, with the Middle East lighting up like a Roman candle, there is going to be bloodshed during these five months. Now that we have the obvious out of the way, let's dig deeper. Unlike Dana's other calendar dreams, this calendar is a scroll. Because the Holy Scriptures were originally written on scrolls, we are being prompted to look into the Old Testament to help interpret this dream, which I've done. Also, the five months is a clue that we should focus on the first five books of the Old Testament, known as the teachings of Moses, which I have done. Now, let's explore the hands with blood dripping to the ground. After the Almighty cleansed the corrupted blood from the earth with the flood, he told Noah that life was in the blood and that he required blood from the hand of every man. With modern technology, blood can tell us a lot about a person, from their sugar levels to their ethnicity. Also, blood contains our genetic code, which helps make us who we are. DNA is better than any eye scan or fingerprint when it comes to identifying a person. Those who alter their DNA are no longer made in the image of our Creator. They are unnatural, an abomination. They have lost their identity. I cannot overemphasize this. Please, 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 do not let anyone peer pressure you into altering your genetic markers. Before I get a bunch of ugly comments about DNA manipulation not being the mark of the beast, because it has nothing to do with the hand or forehead, let's explore what the Old Testament says. You might be surprised to know, in Exodus, the Almighty decreed that all the firstborn would die, except for those who had the blood of the Passover lamb on the lintel and posts of their door. Later on, he talks about those who were redeemed as having something that is like a mark on their hand and frontlets between their eyes. Recognizing that the blood of our Savior has redeemed us, Believers have received a mark. Although we might not see it, 
the Almighty knows it's there, and He knows when it's been corrupted. This is why our Savior warned, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. During that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name, and in your name cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. And of course, even if you've lived your entire life serving him, how could he know you if you've lost your identity? The Crimson Calendar holds a couple more secrets, and I'll talk about them shortly. But for now, I want to give you a moment to share this video with your friends and family who are on the fence about this global crisis. Don't argue with them. Let them watch the video and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to them. If their heart is still hardened, at least you can have a clear conscience knowing that you did your part to help warn them. After the Crimson Calendar is seen, Dana dreamt about prominent world leaders. Like the runners, we have to be careful about our first impressions. What we think is an international conspiracy against the U.S. turns out to be a secret alliance that includes the U.S. The reason that these nations are using high-powered binoculars is because they are actually looking to the U.S. for guidance but keeping a safe distance. They don't want people to suspect any hidden agenda for 2021. This secrecy is reinforced as they whisper with each other on the phones. Through the binoculars, they saw the U.S. flag at half mass and smoking. This shows that the nation is divided by the message of the stiff neck runner as he spreads fires all over the United States. And they saw military on the ground, directing traffic. This clip shows us what the military is currently doing in the U.S. Our administration will reimburse states 100% when their National Guard is deployed in the fight against COVID. Based on what the world leaders see through their high-powered binoculars, all the members of the secret alliance begin to wave their flags. It's only after the colorful runner starts yelling, wake up, wake them up, that the secret alliance becomes concerned. Dana saw generals in an underground facility receiving phone calls on rotary phones. Because we know the end of the dream, we know that these calls are coming in from the secret alliance. The old rotary phones shows us that this alliance and agenda has been around for a while. People respond to the incoming calls by putting numbers on a large map, which has the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. By reading Revelation 17, we know that the waters represent different people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The reason that Dana dreamt about numbers being placed on the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans is because people from all over the world are being separated into two groups. And based on the overall theme of this dream, I have no doubt who those two groups are. They are separating the corrupted from the uncorrupted. Amidst the chaos, the world leaders start to say, it might be our time. On the eighth day of Dana's dream, after the race is over, the world leaders hang up their phones at the same time and say in unison, it's time. Then, as if realizing the gravity of the situation, they place their heads 
on their hands and weep. At the beginning of this dream, Dana saw a globe. It represents man's desire to control things on the earth. However, the globe is spinning on its own. The invisible hand lets us know that our Creator is the one who is really running the show. Realizing that their time is up, the world leaders show repentance by weeping. Finally, they are willing to yield to the will of the Almighty. The Bible has several passages that warn about the nations being judged. One that I think is fitting for this dream is found in Zebaniah chapter 3. In it, the Lord tells us to wait upon him, because it is his intention to gather all the nations and devour them with the fierce fire of his jealousy. For then he will restore a pure language, so that all may call upon his name in agreement. This is the Paleo-Hebrew name of our Heavenly Father. It's pronounced Yehua, and it means He exists. The background is a temporary crematorium in India to help cope with the current crisis. There's an idea out there that there are many ways to get to heaven, but I can tell you that no one is more prepared to cope with these trying times than those who keep the commands of our Heavenly Father and carry the testimony of His Son. I want to show you a clip from my Bible project, Sword of the Spirit. It gives us a better understanding about our Heavenly Father and His coming judgment. You can find it on my YouTube channel called Out of Darkness. If you don't mind, please subscribe. Here you can see the first five books of the Old Testament in chapter-by-chapter chapter playlists. The passage is in Leviticus. I have to warn you that some of the names and words are going to sound strange to you. That's because I am using a reconstructed Paleo-Hebrew with an American accent. Sorry guys, I did my best. Choreb Beruach Sword of the Spirit Interpreted and narrated by Wendy Yakara Leviticus Chapter 26 You will make yourself no idols, nor graven image nor will you rear up a standing monument, nor will you set up any stone image in your land to bow down to it, for I am Yehua, your Elohim. You will keep my Shabbats and reverence my sanctuary. I am Yehua. If you will walk in my customs and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season and the land will yield her increase, and the trees of the field will yield their fruit, and your threshing will reach until its vintage. Also, the vintage will reach until its sowing time. Therefore, you will eat your bread until full, and safely dwell in your land. And I will give peace in the land, and you will lie down, and no one will make you afraid and I will rid evil beasts out from the land, nor will the sword go through your land, and you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Therefore five of you will chase one hundred, and one hundred of you will put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword, and I will turn towards you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. Surely you will eat the old before you bring out the new. Also, I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul will not detest you, and I will walk among you, 
and be your Elohim, and you will be my people. I am Yehua, your Elohim, who brought you forth from the land of Mitraim, so that you will not be their bondmen, and I have broken the bonds of your yoke and made you go upright. But if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if you will despise my customs, or if your soul detests my guidelines, so that you will not do all my commandments, that you break my covenant, then I will do this unto you. I will appoint the terror, the wasting disease over you, and a fever will consume the eyes, and with a sorrowful heart, then you will sow your seed in vain, for your enemies will eat it. Furthermore, I will set my face against you, and you will be slain before your enemies. Those who hate you will reign over you, and you will flee when no one pursues you. Still, if after this you will not hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven more times for your sins, and I will break the power of your pride, and I will make your heavens as iron, and your earth as copper, and your strength will be spent in vain, for your land will not yield her increase, nor will the trees from the land yield their fruit. Still yet, if you walk contrary to me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you, according to your sins. Also, I will send wild beasts among you, which will rob you of your children, and destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, and your ways will become desolate. Still, if you will not become reformed unto me by these things, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you also, and punish you another seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you, which will render vengeance for the covenant. And when you are gathered together in your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and you will be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I have broken the staff of your bread, Ten women will bake your bread in one oven, and they will deliver your bread again by weight, and you will eat but not be satisfied. Still, if during this you have not hearkened unto me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you also with fury, and surely I will chastise you seven times for your sins. Therefore you will eat the flesh of your sons, and you will eat the flesh of your daughters. Also, I will destroy your high places, and cut down your sun pillars, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and detest your soul. And I will make your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries to desolation and I will not smell the savor of your sweet scent. Also, I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell in it will be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the nations, and draw out a sword after you. Then your land will become desolate, and your cities waste. Moreover, the land will enjoy her Shabbats, as long as it lies desolate, and you are in the land of your enemies, then the land will rest and enjoy her Shabbats. As long as it lies desolate, it will rest, because it did not rest during your Shabbats when you dwelt upon it. And upon those who are left of you, I will send a weariness into their hearts in the land of their enemies and the sound of a shaking leaf will chase them, and they will flee as if fleeing from a sword, and they will fall when no one pursues. Also they will fall one upon another, as if they were before a sword, when no one pursues, 
and you will have no power to stand before your enemies. Therefore, you will perish among the nations, and the land of your enemies will consume you. And those who are left from you will rot away in their iniquity in the lands of their enemies. Also, they will rot away in the iniquities of their fathers. If they will confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they have trespassed against me, also that they have walked contrary to me, and that I too have walked contrary to them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, then I will accept the punishment of their iniquity. Furthermore, I will remember my covenant with Yaqub, and also my covenant with Yitzhak, and also my covenant with Abraham. I will remember, and I will remember the land. Also, the land will be left of them, and will enjoy her Shabbats, while she lies desolate without them. Therefore, they will accept the punishment of their iniquity, for surely they despised my guidelines, and because their soul detested my customs. However, because of this, while in the land of their enemies, I will not completely cast them away, nor detest them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am Yehua, their Elohim. Also, for their sakes, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out from the land of Mitzrayim, in the sight of the nations, that I might be their Elohim. I am he who exists. These are the customs and guidelines and teachings which Yehua made between him and the children of Yeshareel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Musha. As you can see from the passage I read, Yehua has warned about what he will do a long time ago. None of us should be surprised by all that is happening. And yet, I'm sure that many of you feel completely caught off guard. For those of you who have already become corrupted and are wondering if there is hope for you, I know that the Almighty is using a strong hand to force his will upon the people, and I know he is able to snatch people from the fire. We see this in Zechariah 3, when an angel of Yehua scolds Satan about a high priest who happens to have the same Pelu Hebrew name as our Messiah, Yehushua, the son of Yehutzadak. Yehua rebuke you, O Satan, and Yehua rebuke you, O chosen of Jerusalem. Is this not an ember plucked from the fire? I am sure that the Most High will show mercy and heal those who sincerely repent and obey His will. If you don't know His will, please subscribe. I'm going to set my Bible project aside for a few months and teach on the foundation of our faith. It's no accident that the five-month segment of this very long race ends in September. For two years now, the Almighty has been giving Dana dreams about September. Why? Because Yehua has several set-apart holy days in September. I had posted a dream interpretation of Dana's solemn September assembly dream last year, but took it down. In response to this dream, I went ahead and reposted it. The fact that it took Dana eight days to complete his dream gives us a big clue that our Heavenly Father wants to direct our attention to the eighth day solemn assembly that occurs right after the seven day feast of tabernacles. We are living out prophecy. Zechariah 14 tells us about a plague, and in verse 16 it says, 
And it shall come to pass that every one who survives of all the nations will come to Jerusalem and will ascend from year to year to worship the King, Yehua of hosts, also to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. For years, more and more people have come to know and understand the truth, but many choose to follow the sins of their fathers. Our Savior is crying out to those who are living in darkness. He's pleading with them to repent before it's too late. Those who continue to ignore His will are living in rebellion. And the Bible compares rebellion against Him to witchcraft. At the end of the race, the man who represents the King of Kings pointed to Dana and said, Warn them that there's not much time and it will never be easy again. If you're not braced now, you won't make it. If you're not rooted, you will be pulled up and pulled out, and the fire will never go out. Look for me and endure until I come. In Revelation, we learn that the King of Kings will rule with an iron rod, and that lukewarm believers will be spit out of his mouth. The training wheels are coming off. People need to stop living in sin and start repenting. People need to stop turning to man and start relying on the great I Am. I want to thank everyone for watching to the end. I know that my interpretation may be overwhelming and even confusing to many of you, but this is important stuff. You might have to watch the video a couple of times to soak it in. In summary, Dana's dream is about the hour of judgment. The King of Kings is about to come into his glory, and he is going to separate the corrupted from the uncorrupted, the sheep from the goats, the clean from the unclean, the obedient from the disobedient, the holy from the unholy, and the wheat from the chaff. My name is Wendy, and you've been called out of darkness.